Life, we are committed to having a venue like this to explore the issue of racial reconciliation and racial justice uh, because uh, there are a lot of tensions, uh, if you haven't been following, a lot of tensions uh, in the air as it pertains to race and power in the church. And so we wanted to have an ongoing conversation, a safe space to explore issues of the multifaceted uh, nature of racial reconciliation. And the reason we put this together at New Life is because this is one of our core values. At New Life, we have five M's, and one of those M's is that we are a multiracial community bridging racial, cultural, economic, and gender barriers uh, for Christ. And so at New Life, we take this very seriously. We believe that racial reconciliation isn't uh, a marginal part of the gospel, that if you get to it, if you have time to get to racial reconciliation, then good for you. And if you don't, hey, there's other things to focus on. We believe that racial reconciliation is part and parcel of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we have to be working for it with a lot of energy. And so uh, at our church here, this is something that we've been wrestling with for almost 30 years together, trying to figure out the multifaceted nature of reconciliation. Because at New Life, this is an a, a ongoing reality for us. We have over 75 nations that are represented in our church. And so it's a beautiful place, but it's also a very complex place especially when there's tension uh, in the media and tension in our world, we see that tension reflected very clearly in our community here. And we believe that we wanted to put these gatherings together because it's very easy for the church to stop at an aesthetic diversity where just we get together and we, we look different and we're all together sitting in the same car, but the church is to be more than just a sanctified subway car, all right? A uh, subway car is a crowd of diverse, anonymous people in close proximity to each other. And, and we get, we're close together, and then we get off our stop, and then there's no kind of uh, interaction or integration at all. We're not growing from each other. And the church can very easily become just a sanctified subway car. But we're to be more than just a sanctified subway car. We are to experience the, the gospel of reconciliation and the kingdom of of reconciliation that's available to us in Jesus. And so the kingdom reconciliation speaks about the soul of a person, speaks about the structures of society, it speaks about the supernatural powers beyond this realm here. And, and so we want to take this uh, very, very seriously. Our goal today is uh, to really get uh, clear in terms of the, the, the multiple perspectives as it pertains to reconciliation and justice. Uh, to provoke further contemplation and action. That's really our hope. That at the end of our day, something would be provoked inside of you to further deeply contemplate, but not a contemplation that leads to inactivity, a contemplation that leads to concrete action uh, in our respective contexts, in our neighborhoods, in our churches, in our, on our campuses, wherever we go, so that we would be ministers of reconciliation. And so... Uh, just uh, in terms of the day, we're going to have a, a series of talks, so we're in for a full day. And let me just say, from the onset, there's going to be a lot coming at you. And so uh, I, my encouragement to you is not that you are trying to capture everything that every person says. What you really want to be looking for today is, what is God speaking to you for your specific context? What is God saying to you for your specific context? We're not just here to take notes. We're here to uh, pay attention to what God is saying to us uh, in this room here. And so we'll have some talks. After each talk, there's going to be a time for just small group interaction. My, uh, my preference in this room, this, I think about eight or nine at a table or so, is that th these uh, small group times are going to be about 10 minutes long. We're going to have about three of them throughout the day. Uh, my preference is that you turn to about uh, two or three others. So there's three or four in the group because you might get that one person at the table that just wants to talk. And I know they're not in the room, but they just want to talk and talk and talk, and nobody else has any time to share. And so I'd rather you get in groups of three and four so that some conversation uh, can take place. We're going to have a panel discussion, two panel discussions, one in the morning that I'll be facilitating. The second one is really going to be fielding your questions. And so on your table, there should be some uh, scrap paper and all that. You can write out some questions or... Uh, you can, if you're on Twitter, you can use this hashtag. That's New Life Fellowship Racial Reconciliation 16. I just, I know I probably used all the 140 characters with that long hashtag there. Uh, but you can send your questions on Twitter using that hashtag as well. 
couple of important things to silence your cell phones at this time. Just put them on vibrate. Bathrooms are right through that door for the women. Uh, men up, upstairs, one flight. Actually, there's men and women on this floor. Just men on the mezzanine level there. And um, yeah, just write out questions throughout the day. And at the end, we'll have a panel to discuss those questions. Uh, during lunchtime, you'll, it's a, a working lunch, as it were. So you'll get your food in the folder there. You'll uh, know where to go. And uh, those folks there are going to be presenting today. So that's if you want to follow them on Twitter as well. That's just their, their Twitter handles. All right. With that said, let me uh, introduce to you our, our first speaker uh, for the day. Uh, Reverend Dr. Gabriel Salguero is the founder of the National Latino Evangelical Coalition, which uh, offers an uh, important leadership voice uh, to close to 8 million Latino evangelicals in our country. Uh, for about 10 years, he was a senior pastor of the Lamb's Church of the Nazarene uh, before uh, transitioning out to Orlando, Florida, where he now serves as a pastor at Iglesia El Calvario in Orlando. And um, beyond just um, what Gabriel has done in the public sector and what he's done uh, in churches around this country and around the world, uh, he's been a real close friend of mine for over 17 years. He's been a, a seminary, seminary professor of mine, a mentor, uh, a big brother, and I know you're going to receive a lot from him. He's married to Jeanette. They have two beautiful boys. John Gabriel and Seth, they're probably enjoying some warm weather today down in Orlando, Florida. But at New Life, we have a tradition. Whenever someone gets up to speak here, we don't pit or pat and just say, I welcome him. We give him the biggest ovation we can. And so let's give Gabriel a Queens Boulevard uh, welcome as he comes up here. <laughs> So glad to be here this morning in what some sociologists have called the most diverse zip code in America. Um, there are people um, fighting you for that title, um, and that is not a bad thing. We need more diverse zip codes in America, because I think proximity need not breed contempt. Proximity can breed integration and closeness and our shared humanity to quote Diedrich Bonhoeffer, life together can somehow bring us closer to Jesus. I, um, I flew in yesterday, and I, I recognize what I don't miss about New York. <laughs> I love New York. I, I, I do. But as soon as I was on that runway in the airport, and I felt that cool air through the cracks, I said, and there it is. The day before I flew here, I was stopped at a red light. Stopped at a red light, just listening to music, Christian music, of course. <laughs> I'm evangelical, <laughs> Pentecostal, Latino. <laughs> and I'm sitting there and I'm listening to music, uh, just minding my own business, when all of a sudden somebody rams into the back of my car and totally destroyed the fender and the back and the, and the back door. It was just me and my car. My kids weren't there. No one wasn't there. I was uh, startled. I was upset. My Christianity and humility were challenged on so many levels. <laughs> Anybody ever been there? <laughs> I get out of the car. It's a young man who's driving. And I said, what happened? My assumption was he was texting. My assumption was that he was texting. I don't know. I can't prove that beyond a shadow of a doubt. But that, right. He said something that I think uh, speaks to me. He said, I wasn't paying attention to you. I wasn't paying attention to you. Much of the problem of reconciliation is that we're not paying attention to the person around us. And that causes accidents conflicts, crashes, a rise in insurance premiums. What? When you're not paying attention to the people around you, that causes everybody to get hurt. For you see, it wasn't just my vehicle that was hurt. 
it was his. Even if you're in the driver's seat, even if you have power, if you're not paying attention to the people around you, it's not just the other vehicle that's getting hurt. It's your vehicle. It's your family's income that's getting hurt. It's the future of your license and the points. What I'm trying to say is when you don't pay attention to people around you, which is a spiritual discipline called empathy. Empathy is a spiritual discipline in high demand and low supply. Everything around you is affected, not just those who are power challenged. And let me be clear what I, what I mean by that. As you look in the book of Philippians, which is what I'm going to speak to you for the next 34 minutes, which, by the way, is not a long time for a Pentecostal preacher. <laughs> 34 minutes, we're just getting through the names of God, you know. Like, <laughs> Lily of the Valleys, Rose of Sharon, right? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And I could do it in English and Spanish. Lirio de los Lirio, Rosa del Valle de San. 34 minutes, we're just starting our prayer. <laughs> Prolegomenon to a prayer. You're looking in Philippians while I set this context, which is we have a problem with compassion and empathy, spiritual disciplines that are in high demand and low supply. Compassion from the Latin, compasso, which means to suffer with. Not to suffer from a distance, right? It's to suffer with. It is deeply incarnational from the Spanish encarne, in the flesh. And so one of the things that I think God is calling us in the task of ministry of reconciliation is to deep, be deeply proximus, be deeply close to somebody else. Not just read about them, not just have conferences about them and those things are important, but to actually have an integrated life, to have life together or as the man who is driving the car, not paying attention, to pay closer attention to the people who are around you. Because if not, you're missing Jesus. When I was younger, and I'm still young, <laughs> I used to watch Enter the Dragon multiple times. Okay. I will stay away from the masculine metaphors for the rest of the uh, session. <laughs> and and there's, a, there's a scene, there's a scene in there where Bruce Lee is teaching a student. He's in the woods somewhere. He just comes from destroying some huge guy. And he's coming and the student's coming and he tells him to bow and stuff. And the lesson is the guy's bowing. He takes his, off, off, his eyes off Bruce Lee and Bruce Lee hits him on the back of the head. Anybody remember this scene? And he says, never. Take your eyes off your opponent. And then he's showing him some lesson. He's pointing to the, to the sky. And the, the young man, it's a young man, is distracted. And he's looking out into the distance. And he says, do not take your eye off the finger. Because you will miss all the heavenly glory. I submit to you that part of the problem of the ministry of reconciliation is that we're missing people. It's a problem of vision. It's a problem of seeing. We have eyes, but we cannot see. We have ears, but we cannot hear. Jesus said that was the problem of religion in his day. That having ears to hear, they couldn't hear. And having eyes to see, they could not see. And let me tell you, that is a universal problem. Puerto Ricans can often not see Dominicans. And Dominicans can't see Haitians. And Americans can't see Mexicans. And Mexicans can't see Guatemalans. And Guatemalans can't see Hondurans. Shall I go down to South America? Guatemalans, Hondurans, and Salvadorians, and so forth and so on. It's a, it's a fundamental problem. The challenge is not that it happens universally. The ha what happens is when people have more power, the more power you have, your lack of vision have more deleterious effects. I imagine you found the book of Philippians now. I'm going to the book of Philippians chapter 2, talking about worship. Right. Let me tell you a little bit about Philippians chapter 2. This is the famous Christ hymn. This is the song the early church sang that St. Paul writes to the church in Philippi. Say it with me, Philippi. I want to retitle this letter, an open letter to militarized and segregated America. 
Philippians is an open letter to militarized and segregated America. Let me tell you a little bit about Philippi. Philippi is Paul's baby. It's his first church plant. He's, he's proud of it. It's, it's, his, it's his thing, right? Where did, where did the church in Philippi begin? You remember over there in Acts, what happens in Acts? Three people get converted in one chapter. I'm going to tell you who those three people are. One is Lydia. Lydia is a very prosperous, she's a businesswoman. She's an entrepreneur, right? One of the few times we actually have the name of a woman in the New Testament because, as you know, there were gender challenges back then as there are today. Challenges is another way to say sexism. See, that was your chance, sister, to say amen. Amen. Lydia gets converted, so she's, she's upper class, right? She sells fine linens. The Spanish is purpura. In other words, this is purple linens, which is hard to make because it takes the mixture of dye. So this is high-level clothing. She's, on the, she's in the fashion district. And so Lydia gets converted. The next person in that pericope that gets converted, do you remember who it is? It's a young woman who's a slave girl. We don't know her name, which is typical because we often did not name slaves, Okay. She gets converted, but she, she's a slave girl, but she has power. She has power to predict. She has power to see. She has power to prophesy. Remember this? These are the sons of God. These are the sons of God. These are the sons of God. She's the second person. So she's from the lower socioeconomic ladder. She's a named woman. And the third woman, you, the third person who gets converted is a man. He's the Philippian jailer. This is the famous scene in Acts where there's an earthquake. Remember this? They're praying and singing after they get beat up in the innermost part. He gets converted. What's his name? We don't know either. He's probably middle class. He's about to commit suicide. Paul says, we're all here. Don't kill yourself. Those groups, those three groups are the initiation of the Philippian church. Middle class, lower class, and upper class. Men and women from different cultures. How do we know? Because of their last names. They tell if they're Greek or not. Right? One's a Roman citizen, one's a slave, so she's definitely not a citizen. And one is a business entrepreneur who's probably a citizen. This is the church that Paul begins to write. He writes to in, in, in Philippians. He's in jail. Where is he? Where is he? Jail. Right. I want to tell you that most of the Bible is written from jail. Most good Christian literature is written from jail. <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr., letter from a Birmingham jail. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Letters and Papers from Prison, Watchman Nee, and all of his spiritual trilogies are written from jail. And Paul, most of his letters are written from jail. That's why I believe in radical mass incarceration reform, because we need more people writing the New Testament from jail. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. He writes to them. But let me tell you what Philippi is. Philippi is a city where retired generals and military officials live. Okay, so this is, this is like living near the Pentagon. All of these retired high brass people live in Philippi. And so think about what Paul is about to tell all of these high level five star generals and colonels and lieutenant colonels and admirals who are living in Philippi. He's about to tell them, I, this is the kind of church that I want you to be. I want you to know that these people were very influential and very powerful. So let's hear what he has to say to them. Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if you have any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if there's any tenderness, could you imagine these generals? I want to talk to you about tenderness and compassion. (laughs) Then make my joy complete by being of the same mind or like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and one mind. Here it goes. Do nothing out of what? Selfish ambition. Well, that's what my whole career is based on. My whole life is based on selfish ambition. It's going from being a foot soldier to being a general. And what he's saying is, if you're going to be a radically different community, everything you have done for your whole career has to be turned upside down. This is not what you think. Or vain conceit. Rather in what? Humility. Value others above yourselves. If your whole life is giving people orders, this is radical. This is challenging. Not looking to your own profit margin. Your word says interest. But each of you to the profit margins and values of the others. 
in your relationships with one another, have the same mind as Christ Jesus, who was really the general, who was really the top dog. Being in the very nature of God, he did not consider being equal with God as something to be used to his own advantage. Say with me, worship that does not confront power is feckless, useless. All worship deals with power. All worship deals with power. Because worship at its very core is to recognize God has all power and we are all underneath God. So worship is a power exercise. It's do you and I have the humility to say no matter how big I am, no matter how advantageous I am, no matter how many titles I have behind my name, no matter how much money I make, worship tells me that we are all in relation to God equal. If we do not teach that worship is about power, it is not just about power. If we do not teach that worship is about power, we can all sing great songs. We can all sing Kumbaya, but when we leave this place, that worship has not changed how we interact with one another. And so what we have are spiritual, emotional gymnastics that touch us, that make us cry, and make us feel healthy. But the truth is, health is not really there. Say with me, humility, humility. Is, the is the main ingredient to worship. To worship. Humility is the main ingredient to worship. Value others in yourselves. He made himself nothing. There the Greek word is kenosis. He emptied himself. He poured out himself like a drink. In other words, if true worship is about emptying oneself or disadvantaging yourself, Michel Foucault, the famous postmodern philosopher, he said, I know his name is Michel, but he's French, it's a he. Michel Foucault said, don't say people don't have power. You know how people say, oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a justice guy, I'm a Christian justice guy, which by the way is a redundancy. <laughs> to say you're a Christian activist is a redundancy. To say you're a Christian justice person is a redundancy, right? Because Christ sits on the throne of justice. We got bifurcated understandings of our Christology that mess up our lives. Worship is about pouring yourself out like a libation, like a drink offering. Worship is not just about receiving, it's about pouring out. He poured himself out and he took on the nature of a slave, of a doulos, being made in, in a likeness like us and being found in the appearance of a human, Christ humbled himself becoming obedient to the death, even the death on a cross. What I want to talk to you about, about worship, is several things, several idols that worship challenges. Number one, worship challenges power. The fundamental challenge of race, genderism, sexism, and classism is a power issue. And when we teach worship, as a bifurcated understanding of something we do in midweek and on Sunday and in our small groups that does not affect how we transact power, we have not understood worship. And so what we have is people who have no problem singing, no problem clapping, no problem reading books about self-help and self-aggrandizement, even talking about how God is going to help your soul. All of those things are important. But God in God's self is deeply relational. Western epistemological constructs are about, I think, therefore I am. Descartes' dictum, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. But that's not how the Bible understands humanity. That's a modern understanding of what it means to be human. I think, therefore I am. Your brains, your intellect, how you emote, I think, therefore I am. That's very Western, very modern. I'll tell you how the Bible understands human. I relate, therefore I am. Relatio ergo sum. And if my grandmother used to say, Si no puedes amar a tu hermano que ves todos los días, ¿cómo vas a amar a Dios que nunca ves? Translation? Welcome to my world. <laughs> if you cannot love your sister or your brother whom you see every day, how can you love God who you can't see? 
And so what Paul is telling the church in Philipp Philippi is, you, 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 in Philippians is where you, you have all of these powerful vo vo uh, verses like rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Or I can do all things through Christ, which strengthen me. In Philippians, you have these very powerful uh, verses about the preeminence of Christ. And all of it is pinned around how you relate to the lowest part and most vulnerable part of society. And he says to, he says to them, if you can't empty yourself, stop singing. If you can't empty yourself, stop gathering for worship. It's what Isaiah said. It is, it is just a religious exercise that has no power. Because worship always challenges power. And not just in the sanctuary, but in society. The question is not, can I worship with you on Sunday? The question is, do you care about what happens to me from Monday to Saturday? So I, people always say, join my church, we're very multicultural. My follow-up question is, and what do you do for those cultures? Is it about me joining you, or is it about us pouring ourselves out? And so worship, corporate worship has its place. I believe in, so I'm a pastor, I mean, it pays my bills. I need corporate worship. But in corporate worship, we celebrate on Sunday what God has done from Monday through Saturday. It is just a gathering of the people of God for what God has done through the week. What has happened is that we have so bifurcated worship and we have refused to see that it challenges power that our worship means nothing to society. Why do millennials leave the church in droves? Why do they leave it in droves? Because... They feel that what we do on Sunday has absolutely nothing to do from Monday to Saturday. And that incongruency challenges their spirit. You know, what, what do they say? I'm spiritual but not religious. What does that mean? Let me translate what spiritual but not religious means. Spiritual but not religious means I don't want to go somewhere to corporate worship that does not have real life implications. That's what they mean. Let this mind be in you that pours itself. Number one, worship challenges power. Number two, worship challenges individualism. Did you know that the word saint does not appear in the New Testament? The word saint does not appear in all of the New Testament. Only on the top where the translators are. St. Paul's God, you know, a letter. Saint Matt, but in the actual text, it does not appear. Because... The early church never thought itself as a radical individualistic person. That's why every time you see the New Testament, the word is hagios. Saints. It's about us, never about me. Have you ever gone to worship conferences where all of the pronouns are the singular? I this and I that. And do this for me. Even the direct objects are pronouns. Say with me, worship challenges individualism it seems to me this society is not paying attention to me that is the problem of the accident that we are deeply entrenched in radical individualism it is not that we are not individuals but we were created to be in community Diedrich Bonhoeffer said it like this the person who cannot be by themselves should never be in community and the person who cannot be in community should never be by themselves and so worship is about Challenging individualism. And the third thing that worship challenges, and I want to talk about that, is a bifurcation of spirituality and ethics. A bifurcation, a division of spirituality and ethics. You know, it's a, a lot of people have this modern argument about what is ethics? Is it being or doing? Is it being or doing? You know, and you know, and, and you know, every most of the late mystics started putting their accent on being. One of the challenges of some forms of mysticism is that it talks about being without doing, and it lets you get away with not worrying about justice. I'll come over here. <laughs> One of the challenges of certain forms of mysticism and contemplation, I said certain forms, not all forms is that it lets you focus on your relationship with God to the obfuscation of the relationship with other. And so I'm good, I'm good, I'm good with God. I'm good, I'm good. I pray, I have my devotions, I have the, the rule, the rule of life, I have all of this. These guys, I don't really care. 
But true worship and true contemplation is always relational. And that's why we have this, this healthier form of integrated spirituality. And when we separate spirituality with ethics, we get into this argument about being and doing. Let me ask you a question. How many of you walk into school every day and you're like, am I going to be being or doing? It is a construct. It is a philosophical construct that people are not living out in their daily lives. And so what we have to do is understand that the gospel is about being and doing. It's not either or, it's both and. And so what happens is that Paul is telling this church, you think your being is being a general, an admiral, but your real being is being a slave. That's who you really are. A slave to your fellow human being, a slave to the other person. And so Paul begins to write this letter. Imagine if Paul writes this letter to Ferguson. See, I'm, tra I'm just translating Philippians. Let this mind be in you that black lives matter. I'll just come over here. <laughs> Let this mind be in you that Latina lives matter. Let this mind be in you that Asian lives matter. Let this mind be in you that white lives matter. But here's the problem that we have misunderstood that spirituality is always about esteeming the other more than himself or herself. If you esteem the other more than himself or herself, and they esteem you more than himself or herself, we have a plane. Let me give you the, prof the prophetic vision. You remember that last testament prophet, the last prophet of the Old Testament? He says that when, when Messiah comes, when the promised guy comes, he says there will be a topographical challenge. Say with me, topography. I know it's a challenge in New York, topography. Right? He says, let me tell you what the topographical challenge is. Every mountain will be brought low. And every valley will be brought high. Well, if a mountain is brought low and a valley is brought high, you have a plain. What he's saying is, when Messiah comes, the ministry of reconciliation is for those who are high to surrender. And for those who are low to be brought up. And then you have a plane. And then he said, there'll be no more killing. There'll be no more in, in God's place. And so what we have here is Paul telling them, you all here in Philippi are the mountains. Hey, you, who remember Mary? Mary? Mary, did you know? Who remembers Mary's prayer, the Magnificat? Anybody ever read Mary's Magnificat? Read it again. Mary will blow your mind. I love that woman. In a, you know. I may. <laughs> Mary says that when Messiah, in her Magnificat, she says, one of the manifestations of the Son of God is that the powerless will come up and the powerful will surrender. It is a political prayer in its very essence. Because worship without social change is just spiritual gymnastics that has no power. I will preach. <laughs> and so we talk these metaphors, being salt and light. We talk about being a city on a hill. We talk about the prayer of Jesus over there in the sixth chapter of Matthew. And he talks, our father, always our father, never my father. Never your father, always our father. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, basileo toteo. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, political and social. Yes. It's about feeding the hungry. Yes. And forgive us our debts. You know, maybe Puerto Rico needs to pray that prayer. <laughs> maybe Detroit needs to be that pray that prayer. And maybe the United States of America, all the people who are using God language and the Bible as an icon, but not as the truth, need to understand that when Jesus said, forgive us our debts, it wasn't just metaphorical. He meant forgive people's debts. Hey, don't get mad at me. It was Jesus' prayer. Take it up with Jesus. Forgive us our debts. Your translation says trespasses. The King James translated into trespasses because a lot of people owed King James. Deliver us from the evil one. And so all of this understanding of worship 
is to move us beyond the silo of a corporate worship. Let me be clear. Corporate worship is the centrality where you receive the teaching of gospel, where you receive the good news of the gospel, where you leave the social, economic, racial implications of the gospel. But once you receive them, then you have to live them out. Then is the so what question. As I often used to tell Rich and others, it's not can I be your brother-in-law in the Lord, it's can I be your brother-in-law. It's not can I worship with you and your sister, it's can I marry her. If I'm a different color or of a different race or of a different culture. It's the so what question. And so Paul is telling you, hey, you all came to the church. You all came to the church of the Philippian jailer. You all came to the church of, Phili of Lydia. Now what? And so much of society is worried that many of the police who have racial tensions with the young African Americans in Ferguson go to church on Sunday. And many of the young African Americans that have tensions with the police go to church on Sunday. And why is that not making one hill of beans of difference? How is it that we're going to church on Sunday and screaming at each other on Monday? Where is the efficacy of the gospel? Where's the power of the gospel? Where is the generative and transformative influence of the gospel? If we worship on Sunday, but we say other things on Monday, like those people and them over there. And when inner varsity makes a statement about black lives matter, everybody goes crazy. They're just following the, the moral imperative and ethical imperative of their spirituality, which is esteem others higher than yourself. Let me tell you something. When I say somebody's life matters, that does not diminish your life. What do you mean, pastor? What do you mean? I'm so glad you asked me. So if I say women are beautiful, I'm not saying that men are ugly. Although, some of you... Somebody say, thank God for grace. Covers a multitude of ugly, I mean of sin. And so some people think that an affirmative statement is necessarily a denouncing statement. It is not. Women are beautiful does not mean men are not. To say he is strong is not to say she is weak. I'm talking about him. And so when I say black lives matter, nobody else should get offended because it's a true statement. Right. Not only is it true, in a culture that does not value black skin and brown skin, it is a necessary prophetic statement. Yeah. Let this mind be in you that black lives matter. And Muslim lives matter. I'll come over here because I'm, I'm, here, I'm not here to play. And when we have presidential candidates having a religious litmus taste to enter into the country, the first ones who should stand up are people who've read the book of Philippians. Don't make me go down there. No, but... And so spirituality has an ethical component component. It is not a secondary step. It is not a footnote of spirituality. Ethics is at the core of spirituality. James said, talk to me about faith. Manifest faith to me. How do you touch faith? And he answers, you touch faith through works. And because Luther beat us up so hard around works righteousness, then we think that works are not important. That's not what Luther was saying. Luther was saying that it's not a priori. That it's not the first thing. But it does come out of your faith. So faith without works is you, you just saying something that you don't really believe. Let this mind be in you. The Bible says because the mind was in him, he did something. He humbled himself. It's not about writing about it. It's not about saying about it. It's actually going down and being with somebody. And suffering with them and writing about it and yes being unpopular popular <laughs> and
And because of much of Western Christianity is about being famous and influential, we don't take unpopular positions. And that's what God is telling the church in America. Have the mind of the church in Philippi. Be unpopular. Make yourself nothing. Touch your neighbor and say, this conference is about me emptying myself for you. And you emptying yourself for me. And so, these lives matter. Not over and against other lives. Did you know that every letter of Paul to an early church was telling them to privilege the minority group? I said it, to privilege them, why? Because they were oppressed, they had to be privileged, not over and against, so that at least they could be brought even. So the letter to the church in Rome says to the Jew first, why? Because in Rome, the Jews were oppressed. But the church, the letter to the church in Ephesus and Galatians is telling you prioritize the Gentile, why? Because in that group, the Jewish group was the dominant one. And so it's not that Paul had a Jewish preference or a Gentile preference. What Paul had was a gospel preference. Wherever group was below, he would say, bring them up. Bring them up. And if they're not brought up, you're not the church. You're something else, but not the church. You're something else. You may be a good group. You may be a good, you might have a good choir, but you're not the church. You're something else. Because worship that does not elevate the Imago Dei throughout cultures is not true worship. It is what Voltaire said, us creating God in our own image. How many of you saw the movie Talladega Nights? Real theological, philosophical, <laughs> deep. Who saw it? Come on, confess your sin. <laughs> confess your guilty pleasure. <laughs> Talladega Nights, they're sitting around the table. You remember this? Around dinner, right? And the daddy's praying. I don't, I don't know it that well. I'm paraphrasing. Some of y'all know chapter and verse. <laughs> Sweet little baby Jesus. <laughs> Eat a little bitty baby Jesus sitting in the manger. Sweet Jesus. And one of the sons gets up and says, you know he grew up. He had a beard and everything, right? <laughs> the father says, I pray to the Jesus I want to. So we all go to the church we want to, which sometimes is not the church of the Bible. How you doing, Jacob? <laughs> and the, the son said, oh, like that? I like action figure Jesus <laughs> with the kung fu grip. Right? And so many of us pray to the Jesus of Michelangelo and Da Vinci. Created in the image of Michelangelo and Da Vinci. You know, and that is not the issue because those are just phenotypes of an internal projection of who God is. And Paul is saying, I know you think you know Jesus. The essential image of Jesus is servant. God servant who gives up advantage. I like the NIV says he gave up advantage so that we could come up. True worship, true worship always surrenders. And why do we have racial and gender? Because we have problems with power. We have problems with privilege. We have problems with rugged individualism that somehow somebody told us, Christer Stendhal, the Harvard professor in New Testament, writes a little book called The Introspective Conscience of the West. I'm not just Puerto Rican, I read books. <laughs> shatter stereotypes. I'm not just funny, although I am. I have something to say. I use humor to make difficult subjects more palatable. It's called a rhetorical device. Christopher Stendhal says most of New Testament scholarship and Bible preaching in the West suffers from the introspective conscience. Oh, what do I have to do with me? What do I have to do with me? He says, if we had other consciousness, Emmanuel Levinas, the famous philosopher, says, all of Western philosophy and writing and thinking and novels suffers from la guerre de l'autre, the allergy to the other. Edward Said in his books, Orientalism, 
and colonialism. Over there at Columbia University, Gayatri Spivak, the famous Indian English literature professor, tells us the challenge with people is what they write, what they read, what they sing is always a reflection of themselves. It seems to me they're not paying attention to the guy in front of them. And Paul is saying, you want to be the church. You want to change society. Turn the world upside down. Downward mobility. This is across race and across gender. This is across economics. This is across denominations. And so what happens is, if Christ is the model of the Philippian and the New Testament church, then the church has understood that worship is about surrender. So I have to surrender my time because my time is up. Have a nice day.